I will be talking about animal welfare, the three R principles, and together with these um, approaches on transparency you just said, I think we are all uh, aiming to be more transparent in our work in different aspects of society, why not also in uh, research, also related to what uh, you have been discussing and what uh, Marcello will continue discussing on assisted reproductive technologies. Well, the overarching question is why do we still uh, need animal research? And this can be uh, a question that some of you will say, well, it's obvious that we need animal research. Well, it's not that obvious for many people, many European citizens, they think that it's time to stop using animals in research. They are promoting new directives and they are promoting, or they try to promote new directives and they try to promote motions. And it is now being speculated that for some countries or for most European countries around 2030, this is the year they plan to cancel all animal experimentation. Well, we know this is not possible. This is scientifically not possible. And part of the problem is that probably we, the researchers, we're not doing enough to communicate why the animals are still needed for research. Because the obvious argument is that uh, you can do almost everything using cells in culture. But that's not true. And this has to be said very clearly because there are many examples. For instance, Serena was introducing me and I'm investigating rare diseases that are associated with, uh, with visual inability, so such as albinism, where they have a deficit in uh, their vision. And of course, it is very difficult to study vision without uh, an animal, without uh, because it is very difficult to replicate in a cell, uh, in a cell culture, the complexity of such an organ, such as what you're seeing. This is the, the human retina. So this is very difficult to, to, to replicate. So this is why, even though we have to acknowledge there have been quite a few advances, such as the 3D bioprinted organs and organoids that help us to advance in our research. Well, what you're seeing is this is uh, so-called the uh, 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 pseudo heart of a rat, well, this is far from being a heart yet. The heart is composed of many different cell types that are coordinately working. Well, this is a, uh, an organ that has been printed using cells, deposited myocytes, and then you, it resembles and it uh, pretends to be something similar to a heart, but it's yet far. I'm sure that sooner or later we will get to this point, but this is not the case. So this is why we have been using in uh, during uh, this, uh, these past years, several animal models to advance in our understanding of the nature of the, our understanding of the human physiology and human pathology using mice and non-human primates, uh, pigs, uh, birds, and particularly mice, particularly mice because we share most of our genes. And this has been uh, uh, been exploited because as you can see here, you have the 23 chromosomes we have in the human karyotype that are painted with a different color. And then you see the karyotype of a mouse, they have 20 chromosomes. And as you can see, you, you practically can fit and can uh, locate every single fragment of the human genome, you can locate it in the mouse genome. That means that basically most of the genes that we have, the mice, they have. Of course, there are um, genes that are specific for mice and there are genes that are specific for primates and for humans. But for most of these genes, we can really modify, we can genetically modify. We heard before from Steve, from Wolfgang, from Neil, and you will uh, hear later on from Marcello that we can apply a set of different techniques in order to study human diseases. This is what, for instance, what I'm doing. This is just an example. This is albinism. And I'm using albinism since more than 30 years to try to understand this very complex genetic condition with more than 22 genes associated causing different types of albinism. And, and the, the way I can approach is using mice. Of course, we need to follow a directive. We need to follow the law. And this is probably one thing that we need to transmit very clearly to the society. And this is part of the transparency. 
sometimes people is taken for granted that we just arrive at our research center and we pick up our mouse and we begin to injecting things into the mouse or we, well, we begin to doing uh, experiments into the mice. Well, this is far from true. But this is not known because we're not telling the people. Of course, we have a directive, you know, 2010-63. And the summary of this directive is that uh, it is uh, composed of a set of regulations that are aiming to permit animal experimentation only in registered centers, so not anywhere else, by competent personnel that has been adequately trained and only after obtaining the corresponding authorization from the authorities. And this can last sometimes two, three, or even more months. So you have to argue and you have to convince a set of different committees that it is worth doing this experiment. It is worth using animals and not trying this experiment using alternative methods. And again, if you're not saying this to the society, the society will fail to understand that we really care and that research with animals is probably one of the most strict regular and regulated activities we have in research. Well, we follow these principles that are known to everyone, but I just take the opportunity to just briefly talk about them. They were, pr they were pr uh, uh, promoted by uh, Russell and Birch in, in, in 1959. And this is about the three R's. The three R's because we, we call it replacement, reduction, and refinement. Replacement is that we need to guarantee that we will only be using animals if there are no validated alternative methods that we could use. Because if these are available, we have to use them. So we need to check whether these methods exist, and if they exist, we need to use it. And this is uh, there are a number of databases, such as this ECBAN at the UR at the Commission, where you can check the existence of these alternative methods, but they need to be validated. And sometimes this is not actually the case. This was one of the latest recommendations coming from the ECBAM. They were recommending that uh, from that point on, that was last year, they, there was no need to use an, animals to produce a monoclonal antibodies. They could be produced in vitro totally. Well, this is not exactly true. This is not scientifically true. And there was a number of us, including myself, we responded in a correspondence in a, in a peer review journal so stating that we are all for adapting the alternative methods, but only if these are really validated. Otherwise, I think it is a waste of efforts and it's a waste of energy, and we need, really need to use the animals because these are the ones that can provide us with the results. But the alternative, there are many other aspects that can be uh, replaced. In the 90s, when I was starting doing the transgenic uh, projects, we were cutting and pasting different parts of genomic fragments, uh, looking for regulatory elements. And we produce uh, dozens of uh, transgenic mice associated with report uh, uh, genes such as LAG-Z. Well, nowadays I don't have to make any more of these mice because I can do a comparative genomics. I can just uh, locate my favorite gene and I can uh, upload uh, the corresponding genomes from evolutionary related species and those sequences in the non-coding region that have been uh, conserved, they probably really are functionally relevant. And this is another way, not using animals, to spotting and to finding the regulatory element. Replacement is about identifying and using the correct species per experiment. If we are analyzing a given phosphatase or a given, uh, a given enzyme, we probably can do the experiment with C. elegans or with Drosophila. If we want to test a COVID-19 vaccine, we probably will have to test a non-human primate. So we need to choose the adequate species and, and uh, uh, that is corresponding per each of the experiments. And we, do, we should not be, be using a more evolved or, or a more uh, an animal that is uh, triggering more empathy in the society unless this is strictly necessary. And this is, of course, the case with dogs and with non-human primates primarily. Reduction is uh, 
try to avoid repeating unnecessarily experiments, sharing all the documents and the results, and then using the minimum number of animals, but you have to continue reading the phrase because many people, they stop reading like this and they say, you, you need to use an absolute number, minimum number of animals. Well, this is not true. The phrase says the minimum number of animals that is allowing you to reach significant conclusions, which means that sometimes for some experiments, it will be 20, for some other experiments, it might be 200 mice. So we need to be aware. We need to take into account the experimental design, the groups, the adequate variability, and then according to the different variability that we have in our experimental mice as compared with the controls, we might be using a lower number of animals, with a reduced variability or with an increased variability, we will have to increase the number of animals if we want, if we aim to get a conclusive, uh, conclusive results. We need to adhere to such as the so-called the ARRIVE uh, guidelines. So these are guidelines for reporting the in vivo experiments, because if we report everything very precisely, these results, they can be used by our colleagues and they are not in the need to repeat the experiments to get to the same results. Of course, we have the consortia such as IMPC, the mouse phenotyping effort across the whole world, and in Europe, the EMMA, now Infra Frontier Mouse Repository of European Mouse Mutant Archive, which are helping to reduce the animals. So we have more than 7,000 mouse mutants that are available to biomedical researchers. And essentially they need to pick up whatever they, they want to use. And instead of redoing the same animal model, they can request to the corresponding note and we will be more than happy to provide with these animals. So this is also contributing. Other examples of reduction in assisted reproductive technologies. Well, uh, I started doing cryopreservation many years ago and before for preserving one mouse line, we invested close to six weeks and we invested like uh, this enormous amount of animals. This is about 60 to 70 animals to cryopreserving one mouse line and it's more than a month invested. Now we have improved enormously the methods and now we can use go down to two to five males and two to five females, and we can process everything in just one day. So this is a severe reduction that we have achieved by optimizing the methods. Well, this is also true. We just heard from Neil Humphreys about the, the CRISPR-Cas and about the, the different ways in which you produce the mutations. And of course, when you are producing these CRISPR-Cas mice, because they are all mosaics and because they carry many different alleles, the reality is that you have to scan a number of lines. And at the end of the day, perhaps you will be using more animals than required. So you need to be aware that sometimes the application of the CRISPR-Cas technology, if not done appropriately, we um, end up using more animals. So this is something we need to take into account and to reduce as possible. But at the same time, CRISPR-Cas, they also provide us a way to reduce the number of animals. For instance, when we want to generate complex mouse models in which we, we need to add a third mutation or a third genetic modification on the top of two that they are already present in that animal. If we would follow Mendelian case and produce this third mutation on its own, then it will be resulting in an enormous amount of animals. Whereas with CRISPR, we can prepare the embryos of this strain that carries already the two modifications. And on this genetic background, we can introduce the third, which is a way of reducing the number of animals. So this is favorable and this is a way CRISPR-Cas technology are helping us to reduce the animals that we are applying in this type of experiments. So there is a number of recommendations that we can apply, especially using all methodologies, using, for instance, quick genotyping methods, including massive sequence, next generation sequences. And you can read about this on a paper that we published on a protocol paper that we published last year, where we document 
all these different things. This is encoding protocols in mouse biology. Refinement, refinement is the third R and we need to use always the most advanced and optimized methods. And we need to care about developing, we need to proactively develop new methods that will reduce the burden and the use of animals as well. There are several examples, such as the non-surgical embryo transfer, which is, uh, you need to learn it from the experimentator side, but from the point of view of the animal, it's less invasive and less aggressive and doesn't involve anesthesia. And for instance, it's always much better using inhalation anesthesia, isoflurane, as compared to injectable. Injectable, it's probably easier from the experimentator, but if you don't pay attention, maybe the mouse awake in the middle of the surgical process, and this is not very nice. Whereas with the isoflurane, which is similar to what is happening to us when we go to the hospital, this can be prevented. Another refinement that we have promoted collaboratively in the Infra Frontier Consortium was to avoid uh, generating PAPs just for the sole reason of documenting that we can rescue a given genotype. We can rescue this and we can document this at the level of blastocyst. We can do PCR from a single blastocyst. And by doing this, we can avoid generating animals that only for the purpose of confirming a genotype. So this is something that we cannot. So let me, ask, let me just now devote the minutes that I have on the social perception of animal research. And of course, we all know that there is a number of groups that are against animal research, and we can choose to ignore them. And this has been the fact for many years for most researchers. They were annoying, there were people that they were generating noise, and they were creating trouble. So we just ignore them. And that was a mistake because if we ignore them, they just continue ch channeling and tunneling these messages to the society, whereas we remain silent. And then the society is only receiving the rigorous information from, uh, from one, uh, not from us, but he's receiving just sometimes fake information or not precise, not very well documented information from these groups. We need to understand how do they approach this, um, these animalist groups, because the question, the, again, the fundamental question is where you put the human being. A human being is separated from the rest of animals as we most, we and most of us will believe, or whether we are including the human being as any other species. Of course, if you believe this second part, you would not like to do anything wrong. You would not like to harm any, any animal because you consider the animal at the same level of the human being. So this is kind of philosophy that is behind this. We have been um, uh, confronting uh, some uh, of these uh, campaigns in the 2013, this is top BB section campaign that was meant to put down the directive and to cancel animal experimentation in Europe. This uh, group, uh, they, uh, they managed to collect more than a million uh, signatures and they presented this case in front of the European Parliament, but the proposal was eventually rejected by the Commission because it was still premature to animal, animal experimentation, even though it was clear that we have to continue promoting alternative methods and several conferences on these lines, they were already produced. What else was happening? Well, that was... Uh, an important time around 2013 because it was for probably the first time that researchers realized that we might be losing the ability to use animals in research. We always had taken for granted that this was something that we could do endlessly, but, but this time we realized that there were a good proportion of the society that was against. So we need to take actions. We need to organize ourselves. That was around the time that uh, organizations such as Basel, uh, the, the Basel Declaration was created. It was also a, 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 um, a boosting of the understanding animal research in UK and at the level of Euro European animal research. What did we do? Uh, or what do we do in Spain? In Spain, we created a working group with the mandate of trying to communicate better with the society. And that was created in 2014. And the first thing we created was a white document. For the first time, we were 
pretending or we were telling the society why we were using animals. We had assumed that the society would be understanding always that we were using animals for the benefit of the human mankind. But uh, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. And this was the first, the first uh, um, document that we created. Next, there were other, other proposals and other ideas how to fight the animalists, how to fight the animal activists, of course, without violence. So this is, was out of discussion. And we decided that we need to provide good information to the society. We need to be open on animal research. And we took a model and the model was created in UK in 2014 when they were releasing this UK Concordat on openness on animal research. Currently, they have 128 organizations that have signed it in this agreement. So we took this as a reference. There were other proposals in Germany. They said they first presented this website in which they were showing some cases and some examples of animal experimentation in plain words, TFSUHFSTEN. This is now being converted into an agreement. And in Spain, we just decided to adopt the UK Concordate and we launched a transparency agreement in animal experimentation in 2016, which is currently being adhered by more than 150, exactly 151 Spanish institutions. So what are we asking the institutions to adhere to? So basically, they need to speak with clarity about when, how, and why we use animals. We need to provide adequate information to mass media and to lay public on the conditions in which we do research that require the use of animals, and what do we do with the results that we are deriving from them. And we need to be proactive. We need to promote initiatives, open days, open days, welcoming students from schools, welcoming groups in the society that they want to learn about this. And we need to open our institutes and, and with safety and with uh, carefully, we can also let down, let people enter into our, our animal house so that they can see by themselves how do we care and how do we treat these animals. And of course, we have to audit ourselves. So we just chose IARA and IARA was this organization that annually is auditing how do we performing. And this is, we, are, we have the mandate to report every year. So this is the cloud of logos of the 151 institutions that we have in Spain. And this is quite impressive and we are most proud of it because we began with a very few institutions and this was a snowball effect in which uh, there were more and more institutions. And nowadays we have more institutions inside that than outside. And those that are still outside they probably will be, hopefully will be also joining in. What do we have inside? We have uh, most research centers, scientific societies, Universities, we have uh, private companies in the sector, institutions, science parks, patients associations, hospitals. You see that patients association and hospital are still in low numbers. This is probably thing to improve. This is how we need to improve. This is happening in a context in Europe where we have already in 2021 six of these agreements. And uh, lately, after UK and Spain, they come. They came Portugal, uh, Belgium, France, and Germany. And also this year, outside Europe, New Zealand was also joining this uh, this club. We have a website where you can check and get all these different information. And this is the result, for instance, on one of these audits. Auditors. So, for instance, all our institutions, they declare they use animals simply like this. This was not done before. So we have 151 institutions in Spain that they are declaring in their website that they are using animals for a good reason. And they are explaining why. And 77, they are informing about the participation of animals in their scientific advances. Almost half of the institutions, they prepare summaries to press and mass media, and 68 of the institutions proactively organize uh, different, uh, different events. 
Let me finish by some examples of practicing transparency. There are different ways of practicing transparency. For instance, we can dissect out and we can explain to the people how many animals are we using in Spain. These are numbers that are provided from the Ministry of Agriculture, but these are just numbers without graphics and nobody is explaining these numbers. So we take the opportunity to explain these numbers over the years. And so we can demonstrate that we have a reduction in the use of animals, we can tell why are they used, what is the aim of these animals. So the blue bars is basically they are mainly used for research and also for regulatory use and in, in a very few cases for, for teaching purposes. What is the severity of the procedures and most of the procedures, 86% are uh, weak or moderated, whereas uh, only 7% are severe. And this is also happening over the years. We have different institutions that are also using this agreement to document how do they use animals. This is a neuroscience center. This is the CNIO, the cancer center. This is the biggest university in Spain, the Complutense. They have even a, a portal in which they demonstrate about this transparency. We have also received the visit of journalists and we have, uh, there is a TV footage and there are different programs in which we have appeared and uh, we have such as this, and this is the scientific part in Barcelona. They organize uh, an open day, an open day uh, where they were welcoming everyone in the street uh, to discuss about this. We, we write on blogs at, uh, at the European and at the national level. We have uh, seminars. This is me talking in a pub about animal experimentation. We have no, videos in permanent which permanent we present permanent. a person with a disease. This is a YouTube video. Or we have uh, some cartoons in which we explain the use of animals. You can find this them all in YouTube. And this is another way of preparing another video. We have participated this year in the Be Open Animal Research Day by the European Animal Research Association with some statements, but also with a video in which uh, most of these 150 institutions have provided 30 seconds experience on how do they use animals. And this is all available. This is all open and available in YouTube. So I'm just finishing, just uh, reminding everyone that we do all these things because we have the society watching us. So we have the society, we have to care whether we like or not, or whether, whether irrespective of our personal opinions, we have a very strict rules to follow and we have to demonstrate the adherence to these rules. And we have to demonstrate that we care about the animal welfare. And this can only be done by transparency and by sharing all these different proposals. So this is the group that uh, currently is caring about animal experimentation and transparency in Spain. And we have representatives from the universities, from the scientific societies, from research institutions, from passions, organizations, from companies, and etc. So these are the group that I'm most proud to be part of it. And last but not least, if you have any questions or you want to have these slides, that I'm more than happy to share them, to share them with all of you. So you can contact with me in the website, the email, or my social networks. Thank you.